welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. So welcome to our uh, webinar today. We are here to talk about a patient's journey through a lung transplant experience. And so we're happy to uh, bring you a couple of patients who are uh, have offered to share their experiences. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to them. So first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Mark Ashcroft and his wife, Maxine. Uh, Mark uh, has, is from the Toronto area. And then all the way from Nova Scotia, we have Brenda Reynolds. So welcome to you both. And so here's what we're gonna do today. So first of all, we'll give uh, Mark and Brenda an opportunity to talk a bit about their experiences as patients when it comes to lung transplants. Then we'll have a Q&A session. I will ask them both some questions and we'll give them a chance to uh, share their experiences. Um, and then we'll have an open Q&A session. And so for those of you that are interested, there is an ability to ask questions through the CPFF uh, app. If you go into the events tab, you can find this uh, event, the uh, patient journey. And then within there, there's a Q&A tab where you can submit questions. And so we'll be sure to check in on those questions to see if there's any. And if we have time, we'd be happy to share them with uh, Mark and Brenda. All right, so let's get started off. So Mark, if I may start with you, please. So why don't you start off just telling us a little bit about your experience as a patient when it comes to the lung transplant that you had. Okay, um, well, my experience actually goes back to 97. My brother passed away from pulmonary fibrosis. I was tested. My doctor sent me to a respirologist right away and they found nothing. And he said, I would come back to him if I developed a cough. He said, that would be the first thing that would happen. So 21 years later, I got the cough. Went back to him. They did the testing, pulmonary function, CAT scans, everything. Found scarring, called it interstitial lung disease, didn't formally diagnose it as IPF and followed me every six months with a pulmonary function. Everything went fine till 21. And it was, I guess the test was a little bit off. So he then called it IPF, put me on OFEV. And I gotta admit, I'm one of the lucky ones. I had no side effects to the OFEV. Everybody else I talked to had some pretty serious side effects that I skated through that one. And I was fine until August. My cough got worse. Went for a pulmonary function. Failed it miserably. Couldn't do it. Got into coughing jags. They did a chest x-ray, thought I had a chest infection. Put me on antibiotics, two rounds of that. Getting worse. So they got me under control. Got some um, prednisone, got the swelling down. But by that point, I'd lost 40 to 50% of my lung capacity in that one month. So in co consultation with my respirologist, referred me to UHN for a lung transplant. I guess it was about a month later, Maxine and I met with the doctor online who explained the program. Absolutely fabulous, it explained it all walked us through what to expect, and then wanted to know if we were interested in proceeding. Of course, said yes right away, and I guess it was, that was in November, and it was March, we went through all the testing. And it's quite extensive, the angiograms, echocardiograms, pulmonary function, I think what else, there's a, a lot of tests anyways. And then we had to wait till the end of April because I had a colonoscopy scheduled and they wanted the results of that to make sure I was cancer free. In June of last year, I got listed on the 13th of June. So we were fairly hopeful that we were gonna be one of those lucky ones and get the call the first or second day. So every time the phone rang, it was just the tension. After about a month, we realized that it's gonna happen when it happens and you can't, wishing for it's not gonna make it happen any quicker. So we just sort of tried to enjoy the summer and 
carry on and September 30th, I got the call. And they don't talk about this too much, but they call it a dry run. Got there, spent 18 hours in the hospital and they came in and said, the lungs weren't good enough, go home. It's pretty devastating. First time that happens, it's devastating. Second time, it's not quite as bad, but it's still. And talking to people, some people had four and five of them. I just can't imagine. I had two and that was enough. But anyways, moving forward, um, October, we caught COVID. So I was off the list for a month. Fortunately, got a call in November again. Went in, failed the COVID test. So got sent home. They found remnants of the COVID. A few days later, they called and said, you know what, next time if we find remnants, if you get called, we're just gonna do the operation because we know what it is. But so that was my second dry run. Um, January, got the call and they did the transplant January 17th. Very fortunate, I recovered quickly. I was home in 10 days. Um, a month later, got a rejection, which was pretty severe. I was back in for 19 days. So twice as long with the rejection as I was in the original operation. But they did all the treatments and things improved, doing fine. Just had my six month checkup last week. Yeah, last week. And everything's going great. My blood works a little bit off, but that's just one of the side effects of the meds. And I've got my life back doing all kinds of things. I'm playing slow pitch twice a week and working around the garden and doing things. It's just, it's been awesome. Well, fantastic, Mark. Thank you so much for sharing that story with us. It sounds like it's quite a journey. We will come back after... Um... Brenda shares her story. We'll come back and we'll kind of walk through that. I have a lot of questions um, and I'm sure our uh, audience will too. So thank you so much for sharing. We'll be, we'll be back with you. Why don't we go over to Brenda. Brenda, if you don't mind sharing your uh, patient story. Sure. Um, mine was uh, went a little faster than Mark's. Um, it, for me, it all started in the summer of uh, 2016. I developed uh, some phlegm in my throat, uh, dry hacking cough, uh, went to my doctor and you know, I self-diagnosed and thought I had post-nasal drip, which she agreed with. And apparently, you know, uh, after the fact, we, you know, I've heard that that is uh, quite common uh, in you know, uh, how PF starts with people, like it's misdiagnosed, but not, um, you know, very um, wisely, like it wasn't as if it was just kind of, oh, well, that's what it is. Anyway, to make a long story short, <laughs> which I'm not good at, um, come November uh, of that same year, 2016, I went to Florida with my cousins on a family reunion. And so I noticed that when we were walking on the beach, keep up with them without being short of breath and I just thought oh, I'm just out of shape um, and having said that I'm a very tiny person uh, I probably weighed at that point about 115 pounds maybe a little less um, you know small bones whatever so it wasn't as if I had a lot of weight on or anything like that uh, also swimming uh, I couldn't do laps in the pool without being really uh, short of breath. Excuse me for a second. So got back home to Halifax and was seeing my family doctor in uh, December for a yearly checkup. So when I mentioned that to her, uh, she listened to my chest and sent me for a chest x-ray the next day. And called me the following day and asked me if I had any uh, history of, fam or, um, of pulmonary fibrosis in my family. And I said, no, not to my knowledge. And so she said, well, it showed up on the x-ray and I'm sending you to a respirologist. So two days later, uh, which was three days before Christmas that year, I was sitting in my respirologist's office and he gave me the bad news. 
So I was at a, um, a real, I was in a quandary because I thought, now, am I going to tell my family this before Christmas, you know, three days before Christmas? So I decided not to. I, I thought, no, I'll just wait because we still, you know, he wanted to send me for a CT scan. He wanted to do, you know, some workups. He, he, that was the diagnosis, but, you know, he just wanted to see how, you know, how bad it was. So I waited to tell them and um, for just until I got some of those tests back. So then in April of that year, uh, 2017, the next year I started on OFEV, uh, which was horrid. Um, I lost a lot of weight. I had nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. It was it was torture, I have to say. Lucky for you, Mark, you didn't have any. <laughs> Honestly, you, you're lucky. Um, anyway, so that went on for a while. And, you know, during that time, I was having all the tests that Mark spoke of, like PFTs, which are the breathing tests, and, you know, um, chest x-rays, CAT scans, blood work, all that kind of thing. And then finally, um, my respirologist said, you know, this isn't working. The OFEV, first of all, uh, you're losing too much weight, and I'm afraid that, you know, if and when the time comes to consult, you know, you for transplant or refer, refer you for transplant that you may not, you know, um, fall in the right parameters. So having said that, he said, you know, we're, we're gonna take you off that and I'll, I'll refer you to Dr. Chesson. And uh, that's what happened. So, and I knew that once I went off the OFEV, things would probably go downhill quite quickly which they did. Um, and so I, uh, I saw her and she suggested that we, you know, we start moving along with things. It was June of 2019 that I went to Toronto for, an, for the assessments, which as Mark said too, they're very extensive. Um, at that time you were um, required to go to Toronto uh, for a week to go through the assessments. Now, because of COVID, it, things have changed. Um, so I went to Toronto for the assessment. Everything went fine. I had no, um, no issues with any of the tests. And so in July, mid-July, I guess I got the call saying that um, I would be put on the transplant unit or list, sorry. But of course, that doesn't happen until you actually move to Toronto. In my case, I had to move to Toronto, of course, from Halifax. So you're not actually listed until you sign the documents, the papers, um, and, and then it, it, you know, you're officially on the list. So we moved to Toronto in August, mid-August of that year, and um, I started going to the physio treadmill room for physio three times a week, um, went for all the testing, you know, all the appointments, whatever. And fortunately for me, uh, I got a call on November the 20th and the first and only call. And I went in and got my new rooms. So, and I have, I, I have a very small chest cavity. So my lungs are the lower lobes of my donor. So I don't have a full set on, on each side. So, which is very interesting, I think. Fascinating, really. Um, and uh, yeah, so, but uh, I'm three and a half years later and I'm doing... I, I, I can't tell you, I, I'm doing so well that I'm in awe some days because it's just, yeah. So yeah, I'm very happy with the progress and uh, got my life back, just like you, Mark. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, yeah. fantastic. Thank you, Brenda. And you know, we're, we're lucky to have you both here and that it's worked out well so far for both of you. So we're grateful for that and for you to share your experiences. One thing I just wanted to kind of just, you know, tell, um, you know, the audience that's watching is that, you know, it's fantastic having people 
uh, share their experiences. It's nothing like hearing about the real life experiences to kind of, you know, let you know what you could expect. But the other thing too that, you know, learn about, you know, um, you know, this is that everyone has a different experience, just like you two have had different journeys when it comes to lung transplant. So, you know, Mark, Brenda's experience may not be the same experience for any of you out there that are listening. And so, but they are, you know, it's always good to hear what other people have gone through so that it can prepare you for things that, you know, you weren't expecting or they didn't tell you about. Um, so on that note, let's go into some Q&A just to kind of help bring a little bit more perspective and context to your experiences. What we'll do is we'll kind of break it into three areas, right? So first we'll talk a bit about the, the pre-operation phase. We'll talk about the operation itself, and then we'll talk about the post-operation. And Maxine, please jump in if you have some perspective to add, um, as I'm sure you you might have a different take. So please, you're, please uh, feel free to, to jump in. So why don't we start off, and this question will go to both of you, Mark and Brenda. Um, and so many people that are attending this webinar, they're here because they want to know what to expect if they themselves decide to um, sign up for a lung transplant. What would you tell them if you could tell them, you know, up to three things? Um, you have a lot to tell them, lot, but you know, what are the three biggest things you would say that they should think about? Brenda, Do you want to go, go first? Sir? You can go first. Oh, okay. All right. Um, one of the things that I had said was that uh, you should accept that things don't always go the way they're planned. Um, you know, you've got to be open to all the possibilities and rely on the team at TGH because they are the best. But that having said that, you do need to advocate for yourself as well. Strong, I, I strongly, you know, advise that. You, you do need to adv advocate for yourself and ask questions. If there's something that, you know, someone will say to you in you know in a, an appointment or whatever a doctor a nurse whoever and you're not quite sure what they mean ask because there's nothing worse than leaving walking away and saying i wonder what they meant by such and such um and that's and that's yeah. uh, another reason why you need to have the caregiver or someone with you because you've got another set of ears Sometimes uh, you'll hear something and that's what you're focusing on. So then you're not listening to the rest of the conversation. So, um, so that's, you know, kind of more than one thing, but, uh, and the other thing is, as John said, you always have to remember that everybody is different and your journey is going to be different. There's so many things that can happen and so many different things that can happen to each and every one of us. I mean, I, I made it sound like, you know, um, it, I shouldn't say it was a breeze, but, um, I, you know, I certainly had issues as well. Fortunately for me, I didn't have major issues. Um, most of them were minor and they could be, you know, they could be fixed. Um, but anyway, though, that's, Kind of what I wanted to say. All right, Brenda. And just um, just for our information, so you mentioned the importance of having a caregiver be there to help you listen and help ask questions. Did you have someone that was oh, a caregiver for you? Yeah, my husband was there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So, and then a question from from the audience. So when the OFEV wasn't working, did they consider any other uh, medications? uh like profenadone or anything else no um at that time i was uh i was losing so much weight and i they weren't prepared to just trial something else and also i was getting so close to you know because the drugs are, are meant to slow down the progression and so uh at that point, I, you know, I don't think there was much slowing down with me. <laughs> so, and, and I didn't say this, but it was three years, less a month to the day that I had my transplant from the time I was diagnosed. 
So, you know, when you consider like the first year, year and a half, I did wasn't doing too badly, but then all of a sudden things kind of went sideways. So, um, you know, that that was the reason why they didn't didn't suggest anything else. All right. Thank you. All right, Mark, what would you uh, tell someone if they want to know what to expect? Yeah, if you're seriously considering it, start thinking now about do you have extra pounds on? They very strict on a BMI, your weight. So I've seen people on other forums that they're going to be listed, but they've got to lose 30 or 40 pounds. If you know that now, the time to think about it and start doing it now so that when you're ready to get listed, you can go right on the list. Um, rehab. If there's a pulmonary rehab in your area, take it. Do the exercises. The core strength, it makes a huge difference. I did the UHN program plus a local one at the Ability Center in Whitby. And I did that twice a week and it made a huge difference. After the surgery, I think I was much stronger because I'd been doing that program. And they warn you, most people have a bump in the road on the recovery. Don't panic if it happens. I had a major rejection, they dealt with it. But they say, most people, it doesn't all go totally smooth. So just know that, and when you get into it, you just deal with it and they'll treat you and carry on. So you talked about yeah. the, the bump in the road, you shared about the, you know, Afterwards, you had to go back, right? So that was yep. a pretty major bump in the road. Can you tell us how did you manage through that? Because that must have been quite a, a shock. It was. Um, I think now looking back, there was probably some signs that we didn't catch. I wasn't sleeping well, but I hadn't been sleeping well since the surgery. And all of a sudden, one night, I walked 30 feet to the washroom and back, and my oxygen levels dropped into the low 80s. And I couldn't get it back up, so I had to go on oxygen. I still had my home oxygen. Fortunately, we're very close. 45 minutes away, we drove right to Toronto Gen to the eMERGE there. They admitted me, and I was in twice as long for all the treatments of the rejection as I was with the original surgery. But they got me fixed up, and things have been fine since then. Okay. And then one of the other things that you, you mentioned that, you know, they don't tell you about is the, you know, the false alarms, right? When you kind of yes. show up and then you, you end up going home. How did you manage to do that? Because, you know, you, you talked about how, you know, it's, you know, it's a long way. There's a lot of disappointments. How did you manage to do that? <sighs> it was, the first one was devastating because they told me I was going to go into surgery at noon and it got to be one in the afternoon, and I'm thinking, uh oh, what's going on? And I think the nurses all knew, but they couldn't tell me. They had to wait for the doctor to come up. And finally, the doctor came up and told me that the lungs weren't good. But I really don't know. Do you have an answer to that one, Max? Um, yeah, that was the first one, was a tough one. It, and we weren't prepared um, to go in, actually, even with physical things that would keep Mark busy. He was just in a little room and with, you know, no television, nothing, no window, just kind of waiting. So the next time we packed a, a knapsack that we had it ready for the next time we went. And I thought I can always bring it home with me, take it, you've got your tablet, your phone, everything, your book. And um, so we were prepared the second time, a little, dis I, th I think as disappointed, as the first time when we got sent home because of the, the uh, diagnosed COVID. Um, but, you know, at least you knew, you learned from the first time when you went in, let's be prepared. So, you know, but yeah, that's, okay. that's it. Thank you for, <laughs> for those tips. All right, so stepping back, um, you know, a lot of people are also attending, you know, they're still thinking about whether or not a lung transplant is right for them or not. And, you know, like we said at the outset, you know, everyone has different, you know, experiences just like this. Everyone has different reasons for getting a lung transplant or deciding not to. So could you both share your experience in terms of, you know, what factors did you consider when you made that decision to finally go forward and, and you know, with the lung transplant? Why don't you start with you, Mark, this time? 
Okay, for me, there, there really wasn't anything to consider. I'm an active person. I didn't want to spend my retirement sitting on the couch. And that's what I was going to have to do, basically. So there was no option. Not that I look forward to it, but I wanted to get my life back. So that's the only way I was going to get it back. And it was right. worth everything it went through. Okay. Well, did you have any concerns going into it that you can share? Oh, concerns that what if it doesn't work out? What if I reject the lungs and what's going to happen? That kind of thing. All, all kinds of concerns. But at the same time, I wanted to get active again. So that's the only way I was going to do it. So it was never a consideration of saying no to it. Okay. How about you, Brenda? What did you consider? Well, um, I'm glad that you, you brought that up because I have to say, and sometimes I'm almost embarrassed about it now, but uh, there was a point where I wondered whether, I questioned whether I was going to have the transplant. Um, it's just so daunting hearing everything that's involved prior to afterward you know um it's it's very daunting and having worked because I have a, a a nursing background having worked in an ICU I pictured myself lying there <laughs> so um anyway and the other thing was I I kept thinking, what am I going to put my family through? Like, this is going to be terrible. But then the more I became ill, the more I thought, I have to do this. But not only that, um, the whole idea that I was being given a privilege that so many people are not, I was given the privilege of whether to live or to die. And if without the transplant, I was going to die and not a pleasant death. Um, but yet I knew that there were risks. I mean, that doesn't mean to say just because I have a transplant that I'm going to survive and that things will be tickety boo. But that's just something that, you know, we all have to come to that. Everybody's different. Everybody has their own reasons for deciding yes or no. But um, I, and I like Mark, you know, I was very active and um, I thought, of course, that this is not a question anymore. Of course, it didn't take me that long to decide, but, but mostly the privilege that someone was going to give me the chance to live my life. So, yeah. All right, Brandon, you, did, you talked about how daunting just the thought of it was uh, yeah I mean you know um just the whole business of going to Toronto for an assessment uh well that week wasn't so bad but it was moving there uh from for us that was a big huge thing I mean you know having to move from Halifax we didn't know how long we'd be away uh, it happened to be six months but it could have been a whole lot longer than that and being so small you know, I thought, oh my goodness, how long is it going to take for me to get new lungs? Um, and three months, believe me, I think was pretty, <laughs> pretty darn good. Um, anyway, and, and so then, you know, it was like, well, what about our house? And, you know, what's, what's going to happen to the house? Somebody will have to look after it. Um, and I'm sure as Roberto can relate I was worried about my kitty cat, <laughs> um, but I was able to take him with us. So. Um, and, you know, just um, what happens if I'm, you know, I'm uh, unconscious for a long period of time, you know, during the surgery afterwards, uh, um, you know, bills have to be paid. I have to make sure my husband knows everything about that. And like just so many things that, um, yeah, I can't even begin to uh, list them all. <laughs> but, you must have had a big list there. It sounds like it was an overwhelming list. Oh, it was an overwhelm. And what even, even small things like, well, what do I take with me? 
um, you know, I'm going to be there in the summertime, the fall, probably the winter. Uh, it, yeah, just even things like that were, uh, you know, were pretty, pretty crazy to think about. So, so I, how did you get through this? So you're looking, I'm sure, at this list that was pages and pages long. What happened? Or how did you manage to cope through that and, you know, look past um, the, that big just, list? Point by point, you know, uh, I just had to look at the list and check it off, you know, one at a time. Um, and at that point in time, I was, I was pretty well confined to the upstairs of our house because we have 10 stairs to get, you know, to the bedrooms. Um, and it wasn't a uh, possibility to stay downstairs. So anyway, um, I had to do all that from, <laughs> from lying in my bed, basically, <laughs> and, uh, and trying to, uh, trying to get through all those different things. So yeah, it was pretty, pretty crazy, but I, I managed to do it. And, uh, with the help of my husband, mind you, I mean, I didn't do it all, um, all myself, but as I mentioned to Sharon earlier, um, being a nurse, uh, I was always used to caring for people. So I always had that feeling of needing to be in charge. So that was kind of hard, I have to say, but, um, at being on the other end of it and having to be cared for. Um, that was, yeah, that was hard. All right, thank you for sharing that. All right, um, Mark, you earlier talked a bit about, um, one of the things was, you know, knowing your weight and knowing that you'd have to lose weights, you know, some people uh, to prepare for the operation. So could you talk about uh, any other lifestyle changes that you had to undergo pre-operation? Um, I'm trying to think, not a whole lot now, because a few years before I had went on the Weight Watchers program to lose weight, to get healthy, nothing to do with the IPF, but I lost 40 pounds. So, and I was already eating healthy and that type of thing, because that's important. Um, the exercise, doing what you can. It doesn't have to be Superman exercises. Part of the rehab program, we did it sitting in a chair and they had weights there from one to 10 pounds or you didn't use a weight and just do the exercises to, to use your muscles and being as active as you can. If you're on oxygen, you know, I could get out for a walk, wear my backpack of oxygen, that type of thing. But other than that, I don't think we had a whole lot of lifestyle changes. Okay. It was... How about you, Brenda? Did you have any lifestyle changes? You know, with the exception of you obviously told us about having to move to Toronto uh, twice. Other things that changed in your life? Well, yeah, just um, having, well, being on oxygen, you know, that, that uh, obviously... Um, you know, my energy level was decreased. I couldn't do all the things that I normally would do, like housework and um, exercising and driving. You know, um, I had to rely on my husband to make my meals, to bring them to me sometimes. It was really, really hard to even move from one room to the other. And, um, you know, just being so, so short of breath oxygen or not and um even things like driving you know he had to drive me to all my appointments I was used to doing that on my own um I I consider those lifestyle changes um you know uh gardening self -care, self care that was huge you know um I had to get help with that and dressing and all those kinds of things so yeah there's there's a lot of a lot of changes there that's for sure Okay. And during the, the pre-operation phase, did you experience any changes in your mood or feelings? Brenda? Oh, yeah. Um, I was, I had a lot of anxiety um, and had to take medication for it, which I mean, I, uh, when I was diagnosed with IPF, 
I was on absolutely no medications. I had no other medical issues. Um, so for me to even take something like that, you know, was, was a big deal. But I just felt, I went to my doctor and I just, my family doctor, and I just said, I, I think it's time. I need something because, and it was the shortness of breath. Plus that, that made me so anxious, but plus all those other things that, you know, were playing on my mind as well. Um, but, uh, yeah. And, um, I think that's, that's probably the big thing. Was there anything else that you were able to do besides the medication that helped you with your anxiety? Well, I, I do try meditation. I still do. And, um, at that point I, I was trying meditate meditation, um, listening to music. I, I love listening to music and, um, reading that that helps always doing those kinds of things and uh yeah just um helping to you know bring myself to a different level sometimes and those things helped okay how about you mark anything in terms of your mood um not really i i tried to stay positive through the whole thing for the most part the the one thing that I did that I wouldn't recommend is I fought the oxygen. I just had in the back of my mind that if I accept the oxygen, I'm giving up. And I fought using it. I'd be coughing and coughing, but I wouldn't want to put the oxygen on. And finally, I accepted that I had to. And my quality of life improved. I was able to get out again. We could go shopping. I could walk around the store if I had the oxygen on, but I fought it to the bitter end. And big mistake. If you need it, you need it. Just accept it and don't be embarrassed by it. Get out, do your thing. And Mark, what were your reasons for rejecting it in the first place, if you don't mind sharing? Sorry, what was that? What were your reasons for not really embracing oxygen uh, I in the first place? I think I just thought I was giving up if I accepted it. And just okay. didn't, no, nope, not going to happen. And it was a big mistake. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that. So, Mark, I want to start with this question with you. What, and Maxine, I expect you to jump in on this one, but what help did you need from caregiver, family member, friends during the pre operation phase? And I think both of you have talked a little bit about this, but, you know, please, you know, to help uh, others, because I think there's other caregivers also listening on this webinar, uh, so they know what to expect. Um, what would you say you needed help? And maybe what do you wish you asked for help for that you may not have? So we'll start with Mark. Maxine, jump in, and then we'll go over to Brenda. Um, lots of things around the house I couldn't do anymore. So making sure that Maxine knew what needed to be done changing the furnace filter <laughs> something that hey i just always done it just had to you know show her how to do it um the water meter thing just regular household things that i did took for granted and did i'm not going to be doing them so you're going to have to do them um we had great neighbors who cut the grass did the snow that kind of thing so that was looked after but um getting everything together any investments rsps i looked after them so I had to know where all that paperwork was and account numbers and everything because hey if something happens and i don't come out of this operation you've got to know where everything is the wills all that kind of stuff stuff you don't like to talk about mm -hmm. but we we had to get it all ready and all set okay Maxine, anything to add to what Mark told us? Well, you know, with that being said, we always kept it positive. We never uh, had had the negativity. We did talk about at the very beginning, he wanted, you know, obviously to go through with the surgery, but um, it wasn't a matter of if I make it through the surgery, it's when I, when I get out and when I get home. Um, and that's just how it's always been. And Mark has a really good attitude. He always has very positive and that's just I, I think it's a you know the 
the the power of positive thinking like you just put your mindset i mean i know things can go wrong and do but uh i think that helped with the stress and we talked openly as well so things uh worked well and, and i think with mark he was um so stable and i think that was kind of um frustrating for him because he kept thinking i'm so stable i can you know use my oxygen when we're walking around and you know i can do things i can drive i can you know um maybe i'm going to be overlooked and you know so we think no you're going to get the call all of a sudden you're going to get the call and it's going to happen and of course it did i mean couldn't be couldn't be happier obviously but uh yeah that Dale, I'll never forget that. I may forget other dates. I'll never forget mm -hmm. January 17th ever. <laughs> so. All right, Maxie, I just also want to ask you if it's okay. Um, you know, as a caregiver, did you have any changes in, in your feelings and moods during the, the pre-operation phase that, that you'd like to share with us um, and other caregivers? Not not really. I mean, obviously I was focused. I'm retired now. I've, I've been retired for almost four years. So um, I was retired. So I was just focusing on things we had to do and appointments and, you know, getting things ready. Um, but yeah, I obviously in the back of my mind, I'm thinking this has got to go well. There's always that bit of anxiety you're thinking, but you've you've got to stay positive. And, you know, I kept seeing Mark doing well and at all his tests were coming back, you know, with good results. So um, I kept thinking, okay, it's only a matter of time. You're, in, you're a great candidate for the surgery. You'll be taken soon, I can tell. So, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. They, you know, they take the best, the best match, so. Okay. Brenda, you talked a bit about how you needed help driving and doing things around the house. Anything else that you needed help from, um, from others? Um, I'm trying to think, like, I didn't have to worry about the things that Mark was talking about, because my husband took care of all those things. So I guess my things were, you know, inside the house to, uh, you know, to um, take care of, but uh, no, I, and, and, but mostly for me, you know, I just have memories of, uh, you know, having to have either my husband or my daughter help me shower, um, doing those kinds of personal care things that, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's hard to, to, um, to do that, to ask for that and, and to accept it sometimes. Yeah, but, and, and speaking of caregivers, you know, I, um, I'm sure at some point we'll, we can, we'll have a question or, or maybe not, but um, I think that caregivers are sometimes overlooked in the sense that they can be very overwhelmed and very stressed out at times. Um, some people don't always have someone to talk to about those feelings. And the other thing is, some people are just, they don't do that. Um, they have a hard time expressing their feelings to someone else. So, you know, I, I just wanted to get that in and, and make sure that people understand that the caregiver is, oh, wow, it's just, and, and I don't even think, I'm, I'm not sure I, I appreciated my husband as much as I did. Um, afterwards, you know, I, I thought, wow, I, I hope he knows. And of course I told him, but um, they just, they sacrifice a lot. Um, and and it's, it's hard, it really is hard. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. All right. Um, so my last question when it comes to the pre-operation phase, you've talked a lot, you've shared a lot of details. So that's wonderful, we really appreciate that. Any other things that you know come to mind that you think might be helpful for our audience when it comes to the pre-operation phase? Brenda, anything else to add? 
No, actually, I think I just uh, answered the, I had, I, that's what I had down for number six. I said how difficult it is for caregivers. So just, uh, and I already talked about that. So basically, yeah. All that's right. Pretty- Anything else, Mark, for you to add when it comes to um, the pre-operation phase? Yeah, on the, the caregiver phase, I have to agree. I think sometimes it's harder on them than the patient. I would cough. And Max would come running for wherever she was in the house. Terrified that I was having a, a big coughing spell again. And I'd be going, I'm okay, I'm okay. But just that fear. So I think it's really hard on the caregiver. So, um, and as far as the pre, one thing I would recommend to people, just get a pulse ox that goes on your finger so you can monitor your oxygen levels because you don't want it going down into the 80s. And I know with me, when I was around the house, I could walk the main floor of the house without my oxygen. But if I went up the stairs, I would drop into the 80s for sure. So I you know, had to be careful and having a shower using the oxygen. I forget who recommended it because I was having coughing spells every time I had a shower. And they said, well, where are your oxygen up? ever thought of that once I started wearing the oxygen in the shower I was so much better so little things like that okay great little tips all right so just before I move on to the operation phase and, and asking some questions I just want to go into the Q&A and just pick up some questions and share some with you and so just um a couple of comments you know we have one person said you know not everyone has a caregiver or a partner so i mean i know you both didn't have that situation but you know, do you have any tips or you know what would you have done if if you didn't have uh you know your, your loving spouse with you if if you have a family member or somebody who can be with you even at the appointments because I would hear it one way, Maxine would hear it another way, and then we could talk and we weren't missing things because if I missed something, she caught it. So it's important to have somebody with you if you can that can listen to what the doctors say and everything so that you don't miss things because they bombard you with so much information. It's very easy to miss something. Okay, anything to add, Brenda? Um, I was just going to say much the same, a friend, a family member. Um, it is important to have a caregiver and I'm not sure that, you know, things actually move forward, um, without, because it, it's very, very important. Um, and I don't know whether maybe, you know, social work at TGH might have some suggestions for people. Um, but uh, like I said, I I was very fortunate and, um, but I'm not sure if my husband hadn't gone with me, uh, which, you know, what I meant was if I didn't have a husband to go with me, I'm not sure what I would have done because when I think about my family, you know, they've all got commitments, they've all got lives that, you know, and, and the same with a lot of my friends. So it's a quandary for sure. Yeah. Okay. Now, the next couple of questions from the audience, um, I'm just going to preface before I ask them that, you know, some of these questions may be better, um, you know, directed at a healthcare professional respirologist, but, uh, you know, I'm going to ask you so that, you know, you may have a a patient's perspective on this. Um, You know, one of the things, Mark, you mentioned was about, you know, making sure that there was a BMI or you had to watch your BMI before the operation. Were you aware of a, a specific target that, you know, they were looking for? I think they said 19 to 27 or something like that. You got to be in that range. I don't know how strict they are if you were 28, but that I, those numbers are what I sort of remember them saying. Okay. And we have a um, someone here that says, you know, they were just two weeks uh, with new lungs. Uh, from Alberta. So congratulations to them. They just wanted to ask, and I'm jumping jump to the, the post-operation phase here, but you know, what should they be expecting in these, you know, first couple of weeks after the operation? They, you know, he says he's feeling great, no tubes. Um, 
you know, no oxygen be necessary at this point in time. So what would you suggest? Get up and keep moving as much as they let you. The more you move, the better you're going to be. And probably unless you're somebody who likes to sleep on your back, it's going to be very uncomfortable sleeping for a few weeks till the chest heals up. But... Okay. Anything, Brenda, from your perspective? Um, I guess I, the one thing I always wanted to stress was that you need to pace yourself. And um, yes, it's a good thing to keep active, keep moving, but um, I've, I've just learned over time that, um, you know, you do need to pace yourself. So do what you can, but rest. And, you know, I think that that's a huge part of, of recovery. Okay. And since both of you are kind of, you know, have, have uh, you know, this is kind of in the rearview mirror in terms of the operation and you're in that post recovery stage, we have a question from someone that says that they're four and a half years post um, their operation and they're wondering about rejection, you know, is rejection from, you know, from what you're aware of any possibility, like after a certain period, does it go away or is that something that you always have to be aware of? Uh, I'm going to say, yes, it's something that you always have to be aware of. Um, you know, I'm not a health professional in, in that sense that, you know, I know everything about, um, about transplants, but I do know that I think in the first year is when um, most people have, you know, if the um, rejection, I guess, is more common. After that, of course, your, your chances lessen over time. But um, I have heard, I, I'm sure I heard someone recently who was maybe five and a half years who was having some rejection issues. So, and, and they do tell you that prior to transplant, you know, the docs will tell you um, it is something that's possible. So always have to have that in mind. Um, oh, you know, not worry about it all the time, but just uh, it, it shouldn't be a shock if it's something, and, and it's quite common too. So, um, yeah. All right. Anything to add? Mark? Yeah. Um, every day I have to do a, a blow on a spirometer, take my temperature, blood pressure, pulse, all those kinds of things. And if I have a 10% drop in the spirometer over a couple of days, I have to report it right away to the team because that's a sign of rejection. And if you, anytime you get a fever, they want to know because that's another sign of rejection. So stuff like that, I have to do that for the rest of my life because they're going to be watching for rejection. And you're on the anti-rejection drugs for the rest of your life. So I'm assuming that they worry that it could happen at any time. Okay, thank you. All right, now. Both of you are fairly young looking and, and very spry and lots of energy, but, you know, in other conversations I've had uh, with others about lung transplants, like, you know, sometimes the, the uh, topic of age comes up in terms of, you know, am I too old, too young for your lung transplant? Do you mind sharing how old you were uh, when you had your lung transplant? 61. 61. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you for that. 61, 67 years old, young. All right, thank you. So while we move on to the next phase, so um, I want to talk a bit about the operation itself. Now, I'm not going to, I don't have a lot of questions because there's a lot of literature about that. And I'm sure that's what the, uh, you know, the, the surgeon spent a lot of time talking about. So is there anything that you think that the audience should know when it comes to the actual operation itself? Anything, Mark? Um, I don't, don't remember it, <laughs> but, um, really it's, no, I, the operation, they wheel you down, they introduce themselves and you wake up in the ICU. It's okay. not, it's not bad for the patient. And again, there's something that's worse for the caregiver. They're out there so waiting for you. I slept through it. So, you know, Maxie, you're the one that was awake for it. So is there something that you can share with us? Well, actually, he, 
He was, um, they told me the, the surgery would be at five in the morning. So we were planning on leaving, we're from Oshawa, leaving Oshawa at three and getting down there. In the meanwhile, they took him into the operating room at 1.30 in the morning. So by the time we got there, he had already been in there, you know, five hours. Um, his surgery for double lung transplant was only seven and a half hours. And it was extremely, uh, just went so well. And the surgeon was so pleased. And, uh, you know, I wasn't nervous to see him in the ICU even because, you know, he's all hooked up to wires and everything. But walking in, I just thought, he's had the surgery. He looks amazing. It's, you know, they're happy with him. So, you know, but that's it. Yeah, that that's, um, the waiting is, is difficult, you know, of course. But uh, it's, it's nice to, it had great results and um, we were able to see him about an hour or so later and walk in and think, this is amazing, absolutely amazing. So, yeah. Fantastic. How about you, Brenda? Anything that you can remember? <laughs> I was just thinking, uh, I'm a lot like Mark. Well, what the heck would there be to remember? Um, I just want to say that, you know, it can be a long surgery. Mine was 12 and a half hours, possibly because of, you know, the fact that my case was a little different where I just uh, received the lower lobes from the donor. I'm not sure, but um, that, uh, but yeah, that that's, um, and, you know, right afterwards, I was in a delirium. So a lot of it, I don't remember either. So yeah, um, not, not a whole lot more about, but as you say, there's a lot of, um, a lot of written material on that, so, yeah. Okay. Now, because you were from out of province, um, you know, how long did you stay in Toronto after, um, before you went home? At that point, and I'm not sure if things have changed, but um, I, we were required to stay there for three months post-op, and that's to make sure that everything was working properly um you know still lots of blood work lots of x-rays uh still um physio three times a week there was always you know always things going on and um we actually we ended up coming back to nova scotia two weeks before the, our lockdown for covid so it was it was funny because you know here i was in in, in a way, isolated for six months, not really isolated, but, you know, I couldn't do a lot of things and then come back and, and here we face that. But, um, yeah, so uh, I, I, we did have to stay for three months after that. And I was in the hospital for a month, so um, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't extubate me, take uh, the breathing tube out. I kept, my oxygen kept uh, dropping because of um, mucus plugs so that's another thing and then I had to have a trick you know have a trach place so um, those are kind of some things that that can happen post-op but all right. so all in how much time did you spend in Toronto six Waiting? months six months three before and three after that's yeah. a long time I don't I didn't think so you I thought that so. was pretty darn good <laughs> all right well but you it, had your cat with you that must have helped it's a long time to be away yes. from home and what was that about it must have helped that you had your cat with you it helped immensely he was a great comfort <laughs> all right okay let's move over to the the post-operation phase and so um Brenda, what was it like returning home so uh, i mean you went home you had a covid lockdown but you know just returning home itself what was that like? Oh, well, I mean, it was, I was glad to be coming home and happy to be home, but I was also apprehensive. Um, you know, I had this big house to look at knowing that it had six months of dust probably collected. <laughs> um, and just, uh, yeah, worried about 
things like that and and uh how I was going to do everything and um but it did work itself out and like I said the big part for me was to pace myself that was I had to say you know what the house is not going to fall down these things will get done and it was suggested to me you know hire someone to come in and clean and eh, that's just not me I like to do my own cleaning <laughs> thank you um so between my husband and I and, and my daughters you know everybody pitched in and we made out just fine yeah okay um and then any other like lifestyle changes so you talked a bit about what it was like before um that you know that you were somewhat limited in terms of what you were able to do um talk a bit about the lifestyle like how did that change afterwards well everything seemed to you know come back eventually uh i'm trying to remember i think that summer uh i did do some gardening which sometimes um is frowned upon but um you know my respirologist said as long as i wear a mask and gloves and you know i'm not digging in the dirt i i did just you know minor things in my garden but it had been neglected for a while so i just wanted to get back out there and do those things and that for me you know it's my happy place so for me that helped with any anxiety as well um so yeah that but but the other things you know like the, the normal things like self-care and and cooking meals and all of that kind of thing it it came eventually but as i keep saying i had to pace myself and i had to keep that in my head like take your time rome wasn't built in a day it'll happen so that worked so for me in your in your situation brenda about how long did it take before you felt you were basically back to where you were before? I've said this, and I'm not 100% sure, but I want to say close to a year before I could really say, I feel great. You know, um, and it wasn't that I was feeling bad. It's just that it took time. Uh, it's a huge surgery. It, it's, if I'm not mistaken, it's the most complicated of all the transplants. Um, and so it, it takes time. And, um, and I just felt that I needed to take that time. And that's not to say, I mean, we walked a lot. We, um, you know, I stayed as active as I could, feeling that I could do it. Um, but if I felt that it was too much for me, then I stopped. Okay. Did you participate in a, a rehab program? No, actually, um, prior to, are you talking about the rehab before transplant or after? after? Oh, after. Um, no, I, well, <laughs> prior to transplant, I was going to, and before we moved to Toronto, I was going to our center here where I was doing exercises, walking on the track, doing, you know, all that kind of thing. But because when we came back, we were locked down with COVID, I couldn't get back to doing that because that had been my plan. Even swimming, you know, um, wasn't possible. So the best I could do would be to exercise here at home. And I can, you know, do that from uh, a video, whatever, and walk. And that was, that was my exercise. All right. Thank you. All right, Mark, let's go to you. Please share with us, um, you know, You've already told us about the rejection, how you got through that, yeah. but tell us about you know just the return home and any lifestyle the, changes. The first three months were pretty tough. Um, you're restricted in what you can do. You've got two or three appointments if you're within driving distance at UHN every week. And with me being the only driver, Maxine doesn't drive. When we were home, we were stuck in the house. Family was great. They'd come take shopping but so you're sort of stuck that way and you can't get out and you know with all the appointments down at UHN in and out of the city all the time trying to arrange rides because we didn't you know so that was that was tough but the three month mark seems to be the big thing that's when they take a lot of the restrictions off 
and they sort of let you go on your own. And they said, like, I can do whatever you want now. Just do it within reason. Don't overdo it. For me, the big thing is I wanted to play slow pitch again. So at the three-month mark, a week before the season started, she gave me the okay. The doctor said, yep. So that was a, a big thing for me. And sorry, go ahead. So I'd say I'm definitely not 100% yet. I know my stamina is not what it used to be. It's getting better each week, I think. So we'll see how long it takes to get to where I'm feeling really great, but I, I feel good anyways and I'm doing things. So, okay. Yeah. And is there anything that's kind of helping you, you know, continue to improve? Um, just getting out and doing things like, I keep going back to the slow pitch and running the bases. The first day I ran the first base, I thought I was going to die. Now I can run, run the bases and it's not, not killing me. They even made me a designated runner the other day. <laughs> wow, that's great. Okay, fantastic. Now, did you, um, besides the rejection, any other side effects that you can share with us, whether it was from the operation or you know medication after? No, I don't really think so. I'm, I'm fairly lucky that way. I don't react to the medication like the OFEB didn't affect me when I'm on prednisone. I don't load up or anything. And so I fairly lucky that way. And for me, I didn't have a lot of pain, mostly at night across the chest. Cause I, I'm a side sleeper who tosses and turns all night. So trying to sleep on my back was hard. And then whenever I turned, it would hurt because of the surgery. So that was a bit of an issue for me. But other than that, I really was fairly lucky with it all. Okay. Yeah. Brenda, any side effects for you? Um, I had some minor side effects from the medications post-op. Um, one of the medications that I was on, um, it, uh, caused my hemoglobin to, uh, to drop. And once uh, the docs figured that out and put me on a different medication, then that was fine. Um, and also my blood pressure uh, started going up. Not really, really high, but they just felt that, you know, and that was, that was from the medications as well, um, from the, uh, the anti-rejection drugs. So uh, I, again, I was put on a, another um, low dose of a, uh, of, you know, an antihypertensive drug. So other than that, um, I was like Mark, I didn't have um, a whole lot of pain. So I was never on pain medications, even while in the hospital. Um, I was put on Dilaudid and that's when I developed the delirium. So from that point on, I was only taking extra strength Tylenol. So, um, yeah, I, uh, that was, that was about it for me. Okay. And then when you returned home, did you have any changes in your moods or feelings? Um, and I'm curious, you know, you talked about feeling, you know, anxiety before the operation did you still have those feelings of anxiety after or? no no that um that pretty much disappeared I mean I when I first got home as I said I was anxious and overwhelmed and apprehensive about what was facing me but once I you know had gotten my head around that then no so I was able to go off the uh, the anxiety medication and uh yeah, it was, it was fine. Okay. Mark, any changes in your, your moods and feelings after post-op? Mm, I'd say I was just overjoyed to be able to do things like to, to go up the stairs without oxygen on and look at my pulse ox and say, Hey, it's still at 96. I haven't seen 96 in three years. Mm -hmm. It was just awesome to be able to see that. Fantastic. Okay. And then when, um, so I asked the question earlier about, you know, what type of help you needed from a caregiver, friend, family member, pre-op, what help did you require if any after? 
Okay, for me, I I refer to Maxine as the warden sometimes. I needed her to keep me from overdoing it. I want to do things and get moving again. And without her there to keep me in line, I probably would have overdone it many times. She slows me down and keeps me in line. Okay. Maxine, anything to add? No, that's true. A lot of times he'll um he'll do something. I, I remember the one time he was out power washing the patio rugs out in the driveway and um he overdid it. He kind of came in and he was exhausted. And I thought, yeah, I kind of I said, well, don't overdo it. And he was out there and he says, I'm okay. I'm sitting down. And but uh Needless to say, he came in and he was pretty tired. So I didn't let him, you know, get away with that one, <laughs> remember. But um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm a mother. So therefore I'm kind of hovering around. When he first came home from the hospital, he was allowed to shower. And I thought, oh, okay. Well, so we went upstairs and I ended up, uh, you know, putting laundry away outside the the washroom while he was in the shower to make sure I just had visions of being overwhelmed with the steam and everything and also having not had to, had a shower for 10 days it might be a little too much for him but you know then he came out and kind of looked at me like you know yes I'm here watching <laughs> making sure you're okay but um no but that was you know now I'm I've let up a bit I have to admit Okay, great. How about you, Brenda? What help did you need after? Oh, um, the, the same sorts of things that I needed prior to, like, with, you know, with, um, I guess, with self-care, but less and less, you know, I, I certainly didn't need as much help as I needed prior to. And uh, certainly having, not having to wear oxygen, you know, to do everything made a huge difference too. But, um, you know, as I say, and, and of course, you know, I'm thinking, well, I was three months uh, in Toronto still after my surgery. So by the time I came home, I was pretty self-sufficient and I was able to do things at that point, like helping with meals and, you know, getting back to doing some cooking myself and, and cleaning up afterwards and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I didn't, uh, it, it I, I, and again, every everyone is different you know it's an individual thing because some people may need more help for longer others less so it's just one of those things you just you have to be the judge of that okay now i want to just um you know switch gears here a bit uh, you know i'll start this question with brenda because you know you talked about you know you had to move to toronto for six months mm. besides the moving was there anything else like does anybody need to kind of think about, you know, um, any other financial costs that need to be considered, you know, if you are going to get a lung transplant? Um, I guess, well, first of all, you know, as far as the accommodations go, we're fortunate here in Nova Scotia because, um, you know, they pay $2,500 of, of our accommodations, which is a big help. Um, I guess some of the things that I, I think about back then, uh, there's always things you didn't bring with you. And so you're gonna be spending some money there while you're there um, on those kinds of things that you've forgotten or um, that now you need because it's a different season. And, um, and like I said, that's because we had to move out of province. So that's not gonna be the same for everyone. Um, and, and transportation too, while you're there. Um, you know, we used Uber a lot because there were times when, you know, I, I mean, I did have a wheelchair and um, sometimes my husband would wheel me over to the hospital because it was just almost impossible to walk, <laughs> even though it was only 10 minutes away. Um, I'd have to stop probably a hundred times in the meantime. Anyway, um, so yeah, th that, that sort of thing. Um, but I can't really think of anything else. You know, we had family looking after the house while we were gone, so we didn't have to pay anyone to do that. Um, 
But yeah, I, I and medications, most of them are, you know, they're, everything's covered anyway. Um, so I can't really think of anything else. Okay. Now, Mark, you were a little different because you're local, but was there anything from a financial consideration standpoint that others should be aware of that are local? Um, it wasn't a lot of expenses for us, the getting in and out of the city, trying to make sure we had that arranged. Because once you have the operation for that first three months, two or three times a week, you're down to the city and to say, I couldn't drive, Maxine didn't drive. So it was having family lined up, making sure we had an Uber account in case we had to use Uber to the city if somebody couldn't make it or something happened. And, you know, we tried to give family members money for gas to cover it because it was a lot of them just to drive us, let alone the expense and the parking. Mm. So it was just talk to a lot of people in the hospital, especially when I was in the the workout room and that's a big concern with a lot of people who were on the list is those first three months coming to the city especially if they live further away than I did like we're 45 minutes if it's good traffic but some people are a couple hours away and you've got eight o'clock appointments you're leaving at five o'clock to make sure you're there in time and it's a it's a long day because you're there appointments aren't necessarily one after the other you may have a three hour break, so you may not get out of there until 4.35 o'clock at night. And if you know anything about Toronto, the traffic is not good at those hours. So long so. days and lots of slime and traffic. Now, Mark, are you, are you driving? Yes, yeah. after three months, you're allowed to drive. Okay, got it. Okay, and that's going all right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, fantastic. All right, so... Um, so in the post-operation phase, is there anything else that you think that might be helpful for our audience that hasn't been mentioned yet? For me, I think just having some sort of goal. If there's something you love to do, that's your goal. I used to do this. That's what I'm going to be doing in six months or whatever. And it, I find that that very much motivated me to do the exercises and get up and do things and because that's i got a plan all right how about you brenda um i i guess i'd have to agree the same thing i always i always have a plan i always have <laughs> uh, a goal so um you know that but you, you always have to have a positive attitude too. And I know that's easier said than done sometimes, but it does make a whole lot of difference. Um, and it's not always easy, but um, that, that helps a lot. Now, I've had a couple of comments in the Q&A talking about, you know, both, uh, you know, both of you have a wonderful positive attitude that you brought to the experience any secrets or tips that you would offer because you know it's a journey and you know there's a lot of waiting and anxiety and potential frustration so you know what's the secret to maintaining a positive attitude mark um just uh being able to breathe again and do things i i can't think of anything negative like i mean there's things that are going to happen there's going to be those bumps in the road they warn you about it but got a great team i'm sure all the other transplant centers have great teams they'll get you through those bumps and carry on don't let it get you down because they talk about it there's going to be a bump in the road for most people don't don't let it get, get you down just carry on and they'll treat you and fix you up and off you go how about you brenda what was your secret i guess i I'd have to say to stay focused, um, you know, keep looking straight ahead. And yes, there's gonna be bumps in the road. You have to be aware of all that. But as long as you know that and you still keep your focus, then I think that helps. And I have to say that I don't ever remember um, thinking 
that I wasn't going to make it. Um, I had complete confidence and faith in that team and everyone else that was involved in my care. Um, I, why not? I mean, it, it just, it makes everything go a whole lot smoother if you have that frame of mind. Um, and yeah, I, I often think I, I don't remember being afraid or frightened. And I'm sure, and I still, I say I'm, I've been anxious or I was anxious, but I don't remember being scared. Anyway, and I'm not, and that's not, that's just me. But yeah. Okay. And Maxine, for the caregivers out there, you know, any, any secrets from your side in terms of, you know, keeping positive through this whole experience? Well, I, I, it's just something that I, uh, we always have been previous and, and afterwards and just moving forward. You just have to, uh, you just go with it. There's no formula. It's just our way of thinking. And we just deal, if something comes up, we'll deal with it. But yeah, just move forward. And that's just how we how we are. We're so positive. <laughs> Great. Okay. So I'm going to start closing up here. Um, and you know, thank you so much for sharing all your experiences. It's wonderful to kind of you know learn, you know, get these lessons from you, and to see that you're all doing so well. So if you were to go through this process again, uh, would you do anything differently? And if so, what would that be, Mark? Hmm. Oh, I'm just trying to think. I can't think of anything I'd want to do differently, really. I mean, the working out before was so important. The positive attitude, great team looking after me. Can't do anything about the rejection. That was just my body doing that. So, no, I can't think of anything. I'm very pleased with the way things have gone. and. Okay, Brenda, how about you? Anything different? No, I I thought about that question too, um, and I, I can't think of anything that I would change. Um, the one thing that did come to mind, though, was that um, it's it's important that you do follow um, the suggestions and recommendations of all of your team. Um, that that's. You know, and and I did that. Not not to say that I didn't, but um, you know, it is it is important that you do that, and I think that helps for um, a successful recovery. So yeah, but nothing that I that I would change that I you know would do differently. Everything went as far as I'm concerned. It went as smoothly as it could go. Um, certainly bumps along the road but I'm feeling better now than I ever have so I'm yeah very happy with it all fantastic well you know something that I've learned from from the three of you is that you know what gets you through is that you know you're all forward looking it's always about you know moving forward and and kind of getting to that you know better place and you know not rushing it after the operation right and that you know you yeah obviously you want to do a lot of things and, and you, know, you haven't been able to but you know it comes and you have the rest of your life to recover so you know you're definitely showing showing that way so i'm just going to look here just to see if there's any final q a before we sign off um we do have a patient um 47 years old going in tomorrow afternoon to uhn for their transplant so any words of advice for our patient mark um thrilled for you um just go in and hopefully it's a good set of lungs and everything goes well All right brenda just go for it <laughs> <laughs> shin up and just go on go forward and the best of luck <laughs> All right, and Maxine, in addition to bringing some books and some, you know, the your tablet, any other uh, tips from you? Um, 
Well, I was, I kind of would, Mark is celiac as well. So the menu was limited at the hospital. So I would supplement every day. I'd be, you know, rotating the ice packs and bringing in some extra treats, food for him that he could have. But um, no, it, it, uh, it worked out very well. And I'm really happy for the patient going in tomorrow. We were actually, we're going in tomorrow for a test. So we'll be, uh, we'll be thinking of them. Awesome. That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. So Maxine, Mark, and Brenda, thank you so much for sharing your time and experiences. Extremely valuable. I learned a lot. I hope for the audience learned a lot. For those of you watching, this will be available as a recorded webinar that you can revisit on the uh, cpff.ca website. Um, so once again, thank you so much. And, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, we also learned was everyone has a different journey, but, you know, what brings us all together is this hope and, you know, PF. And so, you know, do lean on each other and continue to share stories and support each other. It's very powerful.